Well, welcome. Today is July 13th, 2014, and we're over in 2 Timothy chapter 1. Continuing our series of prison letters from Paul, as uh, so we're wrapping up uh, our, our tail end of the book of Acts. Uh, of course, Acts ends with him in prison, and I wanted to, to comment on what, what types of things was he writing. And so this is 2 Timothy. Um, so this particular one is the, the, the second letter to Timothy, which brings up a question. Maybe you all can put your hands on the sheet and chat for it and tell me, so, so who is Timothy? Who, who is this guy? Who, I mean, some of you may have heard of him, maybe some of you not. Kim, I, I believe you're, you're, you're uh, the Catholic church that you guys go to is St. Timothy's, right? And, uh, and go from there. So, so who, is, who is this Timothy person? All right. You know what, tell me. So Timothy is uh, one of the names that we run across. This is the second letter to him. Paul, this is one of the disciples of Paul. Okay. Uh, Sharice says it's a younger pastor, grandson of Lois. And so this is someone that's, uh, I would say, near and dear to Paul's heart. Uh, and and we, we make the statement at times that you, you need to have three people in your life, if at all possible, three Christians, and a lot more than three, but at least three. Um, and so, you know, you, you know, three types of people, I guess, is a better way to express it. But you, you need to have a Paul. You, you need to have someone in your life who is senior above you, who is preaching to you that, that could be a pastor, and, and in my case, for example, so I might be your Paul. Um, it could be someone else um, like that. Um, it would be good if you had your pastor and also someone who's more senior than you as a friend to speak to. So a Paul, uh, a more senior person, a Barnabas. Well, why a Barnabas? Well, Barnabas was a, was a peer to Paul for much of his ministry, and uh, and although we didn't see eye to eye on everything, he is, of course, the you know encourager, and that's, of course, what his name partially means. And so the idea of having a Barnabas, somebody parallel with you that's about in lockstep with you and is working along. And you need to have a Timothy. And a Timothy is someone in your life who is younger in Christ than you are. Now, they might chronologically be older in age, but still spiritually younger. That happens. Um, but this is someone that you're investing in. And for some of you, your children or little people around the house might be that. But I think it's also helpful to have people who are younger in Christ who are adults, because there's a different relationship there. And uh, those of you who are in the church today, even those of you who have just been Christians a couple of years, you're not too young to begin investing in other Christians. I know you're thinking, I just got here. But no, really, um, I, you know, the, the pieces that I'm investing in you, you can turn around and reinvest in others as you see appropriate and as you have times. At the very least, you can sit and pray with people at the very, very least, and, and that's an important part of what you need to be doing. And it's a really good prayer for you to be praying, God, send me a Timothy. And you might already know the person. Send me a Timothy. That's a great prayer. I'd encourage you as you think about today that you work your way through that and maybe that's something you need to be praying for. God, send me a Timothy. Send me somebody that I need to be investing in. Well, enough of that. Let's go ahead and jump into the text. First Timothy chapter 1, starting at verse 1. So, of course, it starts out with the traditional greeting, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus. And who's the letter going to? Well, verse 2 tells us, To Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. Now, what tears is he referring to? Well, probably the tears at their parting, I would imagine, uh, and, and is, a, is a good guess. We don't know that, but that's a, a reasonable guess here. So remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. Verse 5, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. So this is an interesting example um, where we see women in the church that are investing in young men. And there is a good model for that. Like this is a great model, that this faith comes down from Lois and Eunice and then comes to Timothy. And, you know, we talk about, and particularly in the Baptist tradition, to what extent can women teach theology to men. Well, there's some good examples where it's acceptable, particularly in a household setting. That certainly makes sense. This is, you know, Timothy is probably young. Um, 
that there is an interesting aspect here that as Timothy comes of age, Timothy becomes a pastor. Now, we don't know, but it's possible that Lois or Eunice may have attended or at least visited the churches where, where Timothy was a pastor. And as Timothy grows then and, and becomes a pastor and takes on that new responsibility, there's some interesting aspects that they have to decide will they accept him as their pastor. This, this little guy that they, if you will, this young man that, they, that they've raised up and invested in, now he's been invested in by others, and now the Holy Spirit is working within him. And are they willing to accept him as this one that they are uh, being ministered to in turn? And that happens at times. Okay, so this is, this is an interesting aspect. Happens not just with women, by the way. It happens with men as well. So, there you go. All right, so verse 6. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Well, so this is interesting. For this reason, I remind you to fan and to flame the gift of God. Well, this is a reminder of something that some of you, or maybe a first teaching for some of you, that you may not know. Um, and that is that while you are given all the Holy Spirit that you're going to receive when you first become a Christian, you receive that gift, it is your responsibility through prayer and then working in the Bible and working in the church and doing those things to, as I put it here, fan into flame that gift. You have this coal, the spark within you that God has given you, but it's only through your own excitement, your own effort, your own desire to be with God and reading with God that then that becomes more than it has. Oh, sure, God's going to hit you upside the head sometimes. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, I chose the song earlier today, you know, Light the Fire Again, because of this particular verse, Lord, Light the Fire Again. Uh, I've gone through several points in my ministry, my Christian walk, when I have been, in my opinion, cold and dead. And by cold and dead, I don't mean that I lost my salvation, but I do mean that I didn't have any joy in my salvation, or at least not as much as I had in the past. Um, and I went through a, a time when I was in Rockville, Maryland, when uh, I, I was, uh, as my pastor said, I was a field laying fallow, if you all know that term. Um, and uh, he gave me a great article uh, about uh, that it's interesting that when we let fields lay fallow, that we let them rest, they come back stronger. And I hope that that was the case with me. Um, I think that it probably was. But, you know, it, it, was, it was challenging in a way because there were some times before that of just fervent spiritual activity and things going on. And then for this quiet period, it's kind of like, what happened, God? Stephen Chris Chapman's got a song about it I almost played that he talks about that, you know, I remember yesterday, Sunday, being full of holiness and grace and feeling you move. But now it's Monday morning, and I don't feel anything at all. What's up with that, God? What's up? Where did it go? What happened? In the same way, there was one of the folks in the church there that gave me a book. It's called Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. It tells the story of the Brooklyn Tabernacle Church um, up in New York. And, uh, and it, was a, it, was a, it was a good gift at the right time uh, for, for reminding me that, that this verse, to fan into flame the gift of God. And I, I mention this to you as, as young Christians in particular because there are some exciting times we have had and there are exciting things that have happened. And there's going to be some times, some weeks, some months, maybe some years, when you may feel your Christian walk is just not what it was. And, you know, it's kind of the, the usual joke. If, if you feel far away from God, who moved? It wasn't God, okay? So how do you get back into that? I don't say that in terms of guilt, guys. I say that in terms of being willing and able to then have this active relationship to be able to know kind of what's, what's happening and obviously to follow along with that. So, for this reason, verse 6, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is through you, through the laying on of my hands. This is one of the concepts that, that this is passed from one person to another. I don't think physical touch is necessarily related, but I do think prayer is important. Uh, for God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. There's actually more to this sentence, but I'm going to take a breath and, and, and go into this. It's very common, by the way, in Greek to have very, very long sentences. 
Um, Paul, in particular, does this where it's not uncommon where one chapter in a book or most of a chapter is one sentence in Greek. And, and if you're you know, translating, you're like, dude, write a period, will you? <laughs> but it's actually good grammar in Greek. But we, 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 use, we tend to write in shorter sentences in English. And it's an interesting statement that over the last hundred years or a couple of hundred years, we have, in fact, actually gone to even shorter sentences. David has decided to join us, so we're going to hear some yelling in the background. For those of you listening to this on video, uh, my son David is special needs and sometimes decides to visit us during church. I'm happy to have him, and you might hear interesting noises. That's part of the church. Okay, so the interesting part about this is let me circle and kind of drill into verse 8 and 9 here a little bit. Start with this therefore. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. And Amy, I know you're just on the phone for this one, so you can't see, but I've got Lord in red, nor of me his prisoner, but share in the suffering of the gospel by the power of God, and God's in red who saved us and called us by the holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. So there's about five things on the screen here, but I want to tease out who are we talking about. Sometimes the pronouns, you, you lose something. And so I want, to, I want to tease that out a little bit so that you can hear that. Okay? So as a paraphrase for that, let me go through and give you what I believe to be correct for who is acting in each of these. As you work your way through it, I'm pretty confident this is a good paraphrase on this one. So verse 8, let me go through and replace the pronouns then with the, with the names of the, of the Godhead. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about Jesus. When we say our Lord, we're talking about Jesus, our Lord. So don't be ashamed of the testimony about Jesus, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in the suffering of the gospel by the power of the Father, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of the Father's own purpose and grace, which the Father gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. So sometimes replacing the pronouns, it, it gets a little different impact on the verse, or it does for me at least. And I think you can understand this. So the, the whole concept here is to not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord Jesus. Well, he's writing to Timothy. I mean, we'll get to listen to the conversation, and in a way, Paul is writing indirectly to us. But no offense, the direct audience is one dude. His name is Timothy. He's writing Timothy. Timothy's a Christian. Timothy, don't be ashamed of the testimony about Jesus. Why would that be? Why would any Christian be ashamed of Jesus? As you've heard me say before, the name Christian is a Christian, Christian, is somebody who bears the name of Christ. Why would someone be ashamed of the name that they bear? If they claim to be a Christian, they claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, why would they be ashamed of Jesus? Or, to put it in another sense, I was listening this week to uh, the music, I, I know you all, I probably mention it too often, but uh, I really have enjoyed the music from the what's called The Story, um, music inspired by The Story, and there's one uh, on disc two of that, um, which is called Empty. And uh, the disciples are talking about that we're sitting here in this empty room, which is the, the upper room, if you will, and we can still smell the bread and wine. But they're here cowering. It's before the Holy Spirit has come, and we, we, just, we don't know what's going on here. And they're sitting in bewilderment, if you will, and they are empty. And then the song goes on to talk about an empty cross and an empty tomb. It's a good song. You should listen to it. But, um, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about Jesus. Why would any Christian be ashamed of Jesus? Put your hands in the chat board for me and just think about that a little bit. Can you type something in, even if you say you don't know or no clue? But, but you know, say something over there. Why, why do you think any Christian would be ashamed of Jesus? What do you think? Kind of old, okay? Fear of being judged by others, Will and Ginger said. That's a great one. So they would, they would be, th th this whole idea of, of, of why there, and, and this is this is an interesting, this is kind of the fear of association with Jesus, if you all follow what I'm saying, of being painted with the same brush. I mean, in a modern society, I can tell you some interesting aspects uh, that relate to, um, you know, there's a lot of criticism of Christians, and, and so there could be some logical fear today of being being associated with that, that you know, crazy religious sect, if you will, okay? I think it's just fear of how it might change us and what that means. I think those are good ideas. Let me throw out a couple of the ones I had, just so you can think about it. Think from the disciples' perspective in particular, and also circle back to Timothy. Some possible answers I'm going to give. Number one, Jesus is not, was not, is not, 
what they expected him to be. Say that again, number one. Jesus is not what they expected him to be. They expected a ruling king. I've preached that before, and I can argue that pretty strongly from Isaiah, that they were expecting a conquering Messiah. They were expecting a conquering king. They were under Jewish rule. I'm sorry, Jewish rule were under Roman rule, I meant to say. They were under Roman rule, and they expected certain things of this conquering king to come in majesty and glory and might. Okay? I think he says a warrior. Okay? Will and Jim say, I struggle with it every morning as I pull up my customers listening to Tony Evans' sermon and whether whether I should turn it down, getting better about leaving the volume up. That's awesome. That's great. That Tony, you know, Ginger, I said this before. I got I to gotta share this with you before. I, I would not have imagined that you would listen to Tony Evans. I am so happy that you do. That is, uh, th that, that is really cool. Um, he is, boy, a pull-no-punches kind of guy. And, and, and you've probably listened to more of him now than I ever have, so I, maybe I'm, I'm on, on thin ice by, by describing him. But that is, that is just really cool. What would you say? Love him, he's a riot. That's awesome. Okay, so Paul says, when the world turns on you and mocks you for your failings as Christian, that's another part of it? Sure. Well, getting back over to my list, some possible answers. What Jesus is not what they expected him to be. They had a, a preconceived notion of the Messiah, and no offense, Jesus doesn't fit that preconceived notion. Now, I can blame the disciples for this and say, those silly disciples, they're, they're, they're just following their preconceived notions. But I have to be honest, I have my preconceived notions of what Jesus is supposed to be too. And so do you. Don't you know? You've got some ideas, and you know what? Jesus doesn't fit those all the time either. Number two, Jesus did not solve their problems the way that they wanted them solved. They wanted him to overthrow Roman rule. They wanted him to be glorious. They wanted him to do these things. They wanted him to comfort him a particular way. This is the, this is the types of things that they wanted. And that was not the way Jesus did. He died. I mean, that, was, that was his response. He died. He died on a cross. That's not the way this is supposed to work. Right? And so they're upset. They're hurting. They're angry. In the same way you want God, specifically Jesus, you want Jesus to solve some of your problems, or I think I know I do, maybe I'll say it that way, I know I want Jesus to solve some of my problems, and, 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 and I can tell him how to solve them. I'd be happy to. If God would just ring me up, I'd be more than happy to write down for him all the steps he needs to go through. Can I get an amen on that? Did you know the answer? I mean, you know it in your prayer. God, please solve this problem this way. Jesus, this is what you need to do. We call it delegating up over where I work. Delegating up. We're going to go through and, and, and delegate this problem up and tell them how to solve it. It doesn't work too well, by the way. <laughs> and go through. Okay? So, they, they're, and then, and then, and then, and then, and then, and then. Yes, okay. So, no, I mean, this is one of those things where we, we do this all the time. We have this preconceived notion, Jesus, you're going to solve this for me. You're going to do this for me, and this is how you're going to do it. And, and please bless that. And that is not, in fact, what happened. And that's one of the reasons why I think they, it's illogical to say, don't be ashamed. And number three, I think it's possible that they misunderstood his humbling or his emptying. It's kenosis. Please go back four sermons. His kenosis, yeah, I'm saying his humbling of himself, it's from Philippians, of himself as weakness. That he couldn't do certain things because he chose not to do certain things. I'll say that again, that they misunderstood his emptying, his self-emptying, his self-limitation of choosing not to do certain things that are reserved for the Father in saying, I choose not to do these things to interpret it as they could not. Therefore, he's weak or lesser or something else like that, which is simply not the case whatsoever. And so th this is an example where some people, I think, could, could feel sort of ashamed about Jesus, and this is the, this is the suffering, it kind of is the bow on top of this. See, he was so weak, he died. Well, no, no, wait a minute, he was so strong that he died for us. And maybe you've never thought of it this way before, but there are preconceived notions that you place upon Jesus, I place upon Jesus, and they placed upon Jesus. And by doing that, we're trying to box him into a certain corner 
of solving our problems and being our God the way we want him to be God. That's just not the way this thing works. Okay? I mean, he says, it's a funny thing. He listens, but not to what I suggest as a solution. <laughs> yes, I understand. All right. So getting back to the text again, let me read this to you again. And with that as a background, I'd like you to just kind of put that in there as I read through it, getting rid of my paraphrase, starting back at verse 6. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in the suffering of the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling not because of our works, but because of our own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. As we undergo suffering, I think it's important for us to remember that suffering in this world is unfortunately something that's going to happen. But there is an opportunity through Christ Jesus to join him in his suffering and to understand how it is we're able to help the world through that. Continuing on, verse 10. He's talking about these things that have happened and which now have been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher an apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of sound words that you have heard from me and the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. So doing that slide again, highlighting again a few terms, I'm not going to go through the full paraphrase like I did before, but look at the context here. Right now, which has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Lord Jesus, I put that in red, Amy, who abolished death and life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. Okay, folks, put your hand on the keyboard. Who has he believed? Who's, what's the preposition there? You figure this one out. But I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. Who? Who is that? Okay. Well, you said God, specifically which person in the Godhead? Who, who specifically has he done? Sure, yells from the other room. Jesus! <laughs> yes! John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, the truth never believes in his son. Right, there you go. Right, okay, Jesus. All right. In fact, it's, it, it, the verses right above it, I think, give you more context. The appearing of our Savior, Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death. Okay, so I, I'm not ashamed, for I know who I believed, and I'm convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. The he in the second clause points back to the whom in the first clause. Pretty sure they're the same. Now, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, but I find this is an interesting uh, uh, aspect of what Jesus does, because Jesus is the one who guards that which has been entrusted to us. And then he continues on, follow the pattern of sound words you have heard of me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. All right, so we have these things that, of course, that are going on here, and uh, you sort of see that uh, uh, he's saying, don't be ashamed, I'm not ashamed, and you shouldn't be either. In verse 14, by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Well, what's the good deposit? Well, we get into a whole sidebar conversation here about eternal security, and which means the whole once saved, always saved conversation. But this relates to that concept. This idea is that when you are saved, that is to say, the day that you verbally admit with your mouth, confess with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord, okay, and that you obviously ask him for forgiveness of your sins, then you will be saved. So go look at Romans chapter 10. But this, then at that point you receive, Ephesians tells us, a guarantee, a seal, a down payment, a, a it, we would use the term escrow. Do you remember the word escrow? What's escrow? What's an escrow? Somebody ever had an escrow account? What's, a, what's, an, es, what's an escrow account? Do you know that one? 
Okay. Paul says money on hold, money in an account to cover. Oh, I like that definition. That's good. Okay, yeah. So if, if you're if when you when you when you write and you get a mortgage, a certain amount of money goes into escrow, which is held then in trust to make sure there are enough funds to cover what needs to be covered in relation to that mortgage. Do you understand that? Typically, your insurance is held in escrow, for example, and go through and do that. Um, the word escrow didn't exist, but it's a, it would be a very close paraphrase to this idea of a good deposit, a down payment that we hear both in Ephesians, Second Timothy, there are other examples. But the day you get saved, something is placed in escrow for you. That's a good paraphrase of what, what's there. Okay? And that tells you, this is interesting, just a moment ago I told you that Jesus is the one who guards it, but now he's saying, by the Holy Spirit, guard the good deposit and trust it to you, which seems to imply you have some responsibility in that. So this is a balance of the once saved, always saved conversation. I'm not going to get all into it today. But on the one hand, God takes care of you. On the other hand, you have responsibilities. Okay? Let's just kind of leave it at that for today. All right. So by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Verse 15. Then he kind of then's going to do our, some final pieces to close out the chapter. You're aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me. And he goes through the listing of all the folks that are there. But then he mentions that some people came, uh, particular Oniferous came and uh, was was then willing to, uh, to to search for him in Rome, found him, and obviously fed him and took care of him while he was in prison, which is great. Okay, so we're going to finish up now with a couple quick last questions. Okay, okay. Amy Amy had to sign off. She said the time for me to work. So there we go. All right, Amy, if you see this later, hope you if you're you're doing well. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump in then to a couple quick takeaways. Number one. Don't put Jesus in a box of what you think he should be. Don't put Jesus in a box of what you think he should be. Okay, It's very common that we have this idea of Jesus is going to be just like this. For some of us, we have the judging Jesus. The judging Jesus is the one who points his finger at us and says, You, you're wrong. You did wrong right there. Now, it is true that Jesus is the one who's going to be the judge over top of our sin. But it's also true, it's the one who forgives our sin, covers our sin, and washes us from sin. So to simply take that one aspect of him and make that into everything would be wrong. So some it's kind of the Santa Claus Jesus. Oh God, I need this and this and this, and would you please do this if you have time, I'd really appreciate it, thanks. Okay, now on the one hand, God and Jesus in particular does grant us things and give us things, all good mercies, everything that was created was created through Jesus, and he certainly grants us his mercies and his grace. On the other hand, it's not like, you know, he's a Pepsi machine. You walk up, put in, you know, a buck fifty or whatever it is now and get out of get out of a bottle of Pepsi. It doesn't quite work out that way. Alright? It's not like uh, you know, if you do this then then all of a sudden uh, then you will be granted X amount of grace. That's not the way this works either. So don't put Jesus in a box of what you think he should be. Number two, it was for the Father's purpose that he, the Father, put us under Jesus, with him, Jesus, as our Lord. I'll say that again. It was for the Father's purpose that we're placed under Jesus with Jesus as our Lord. Okay? We are directed to look to Jesus as our Lord, which I like mm -hmm. to paraphrase as the boss of our daily life. Okay? And by that I mean, by boss, I mean he's the one that directs us and informs us and guides us and steers us. That's what it means to have Jesus as Lord. If you can't say Jesus is Lord, if you can't say Jesus is your Lord, well, you're not a Christian. Okay? That's what the Bible says. Anyone who denies Jesus, Jesus will deny for his Father. Okay? So that's, that's not the way this works. If you're going to be a Christian, if you're going to bear his name, you're going to have to follow through with it. We, we like Jesus for the Savior part. That's easy. We like that. We like being saved. That's nice. We don't always like the Lord part. The Lord part is submitting to him and daily saying, Jesus, I need you to show me what to do today. Jesus, I need you to direct my path today. And that's what this book is all about. Number three, Jesus is the one who guards you. This is an interesting piece where it says that he, Paul says that he is uh, you know, not ashamed because he has faith in the one whom he's believed in and also knows that he is willing and able to guard me until the last day. I think that's an interesting footnote. We don't see that very often. It's kind of cool. Okay. That brings us then to our question of the week. In some way, am I ashamed of Jesus? 
You might say, oh, of course not. I'm a Christian. Well, but there's a lot of ways I've tried to bring out today that you can be ashamed of Jesus. Now, for those of you that are talking about, um, for example, in the workplace, being able to share things and, and you know what I'm saying, and uh, the various things that are out there, this is one where you have to decide what's the best approach. For me, I do it with my Christian t-shirts. I don't know if you all know or not, but I have a lot of t-shirts that, that, you know, various ones. I love, I love Christian t-shirts. And, you know, there are spots where I will intentionally wear a Christian t-shirt out in public in a, an area that I, I think may draw a few questions because I'm willing and able to do it. There are also spots where I think it's a little too controversial, and I feel that wearing that particular shirt in that particular area is going to do more harm than good, and it's just a little too, I'll say, hot as a topic. And, and by that, I'm not going to shirk away from a conversation, but I don't want to spark anger as a way to start that conversation. I hope you understand the difference I'm trying to, to, to do there. So I, I want to show God, and I want to show Jesus, but I want to do so in a loving manner. Okay, and so I've, I've got some shirts I look at and say, yeah, that one's a little bit, uh, shall we say, a little too hot uh, for this particular uh, place where I'm going today. That may not be the best choice for that particular one. But I think that that's okay. I feel that that's that you, you know, let, let God guide you as to what's the right areas to, you know, to share and not to share um, and how much you're going to share in that way. But nevertheless, uh, in various things, if you've limited Jesus in a way, that you feel Jesus can't do something. Well, bear in mind, he can. It may be that he chooses to let the Father do it. But, you know, just because he self-limited himself through kenosis does not mean that he can't. If you have a chip on your shoulder against Jesus for that, then I think you need to move past that. And I would, I would say that that's an important aspect for, for prayer. And, and, you know, talk to God the Father about his Son. And I think you're going to see that he has tremendous respect. I know that, in fact. For, for how exactly he would present Jesus to you. So, question of the week. In some way, am I ashamed of Jesus? And then the second part to that is, how do I move past that? How do I move past my preconceived notions of what Jesus is, how he's supposed to solve my problem, how he's supposed to comfort me, how he's supposed to do these particular things? And whatever that is, I think if you ask the Father for that strength and that patience, he will grant them. In fact, I know that he will. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for Jesus. Lord God, I thank you you sent him, and I thank you that he is my Lord. I would ask you today to help me to draw closer to him, and each and every person in this church, and in all who might be listening to this video later, that you would help us to be strong in Jesus, through Jesus, and that we are able to not be ashamed. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.